Hola, comrades. Today's topic of interest, life is strange. One of the most acclaimed games of the last 10 years, Life is Strange is a major triumph for originality and storytelling, as well as in the development of gaming as a serious, impactful art form. What's the focus? Are you battling monsters? No. Well, unless you count Mr. Jefferson, which I do. Are you saving the world? No. But you do have to save your friend. The only thing mystical or magical about this game are the time-traveling powers of its protagonist, Maxine Caulfield, whereas most major games position themselves as the gaming industry's answer to big-budget Hollywood blockbusters. Life is Strange, created by the Franks developer Don't Nod Studios and distributed by Square Enix, is more akin to a really great indie movie. However, I can't say that even the indie movies it was inspired by, the likes of Juno and 500 Days of Summer, films I for the record love and hold up as some of the greatest pinnacles of modern cinema, have had as much of an impact on me as Life is Strange, which takes the episodic graphic adventure format popularized by Telltale Games, refines it, swapping out the quick time events for a fascinating time travel dynamic, and crafts onto it one of the most heartfelt, poignant, and challenging stories ever told in a video game. A teenage photographer, the mousy Mouxine Caulfield, moves back to her old hometown of Arcadia Bay, where she has a vision of the entire town being destroyed by a storm. In the girl's bathroom, she sees a blue-haired girl, who turns out to be Chloe Price, her best friend before Max moved away, being shot by a snobby rich kid named Nathan Prescott. Scared and desperate, Max, hiding in the stalls, reaches forward and finds that she can control time. With her newfound powers, she saves Chloe's life, in the bathroom, and then again and again later down the road. Risking her neck for her best friend even as it seems like fate has conspired to kill Chloe. Now that's the right cable. Yes! I did it! You okay? You saved me again! Crazy. Now we're totally bonded for life. This basic genre is about choice, which aligns well with Max's powers. We not only have the ability to control the choices Max makes in terms of dialogue options, we have the ability to control the environment around her, a brilliant conceit that heightens the level of interactivity and removes the need for quick time events, which are, after all, to speak bluntly, cheap tacked on events to add gameplay to less interactive games. But Life is Strange is not just about the choices you make. It is also about the choices you don't make, or can't make. The paths that aren't taken carry as much resonance as the paths that are taken. Forever. Can we hug on it? No! Nobody cares about me! Nobody! You told me about your sisters, especially the youngest one. What's her name? That's Lynn. She's only ten. She does have the best smile ever. I would hate to see her sad. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. The best example of this is at the very end of the game. Much of the criticism around the ending stems from either artistic illiteracy or from a simple-hearted desire for the happy ending this game was never going to have. I've heard it compared to the ending of Mass Effect 3, and that has to be one of the absolute worst comparisons I've ever heard. And that's saying something. ME3's endings came out of the blue and had little to do with what you had been working up to throughout the trilogy and offered the player precious little choice. 
Life is Strange's two endings, on the other hand, are not only pointedly built up to throughout the game, each fits a very different version of Max and Chloe's adventure. They are the perfect culmination of two different but intertwined stories with two very different messages. You, the player, get to decide which one comes to pass. It is not just good writing, it is phenomenal writing. I don't have enough time to explain why in depth, so I'll just provide a link in the description to some more in-depth articles on the subject at my blog, jfmillenniumreviews.blogspot.com. What I want to discuss here is how the choices basically come down to a contest of objectivity versus subjectivity. After your quest through multiple timelines to save Chloe, your best friend and possible love interest, you arrive at a crossroads. The tornado Max saw in her vision is coming to destroy Arcadia Bay, and the town's residents, many of whom you've gotten to know through the course of the game, are scared and anxious. Though the cause of the tornado is never explicitly stated, it's heavily implied to be cosmic punishment for your changing history to save Chloe. In story-based games, particularly those released in an episodic fashion, it can be hard to remember what happened near the start of the story, but Life is Strange never stops reminding you of the decisions you made. Not only does everything you do or see in this game have relevance, it maintains that relevance throughout the episodes. That's how it's possible for an adventure that only takes place over the course of a week to feel so grandiose. Anyhow, as the tornado closes in on the bay, Chloe, despite her earlier irresponsibility, understands the stakes. If Max goes back in time and allows Chloe to get shot by Nathan Prescott, the town is saved and the Odyssey ends. However, if Max does not go back in time, Chloe lives, at least for now, but the town is obliterated, likely causing many of its residents their houses and possessions, and some of its residents their lives. Max is overwhelmed. After what she's been through, she's not in a position to make this choice. In the Two Whales Diner, the restaurant where Chloe's mother works and the recurring destination throughout the game, where Chloe first discovered Max had time travel powers, Max is confronted by a dark version of herself, who calls her out for abusing her powers for her own benefit, controlling what she didn't have a right to control. However, before that, Earlier in the nightmare sequence that takes up the last half of the fifth and final episode, Max walks back to her own body through a path that takes her through multiple tableaus depicting specific poignant moments in the development of her and Chloe's relationship, such as when they snuck into the pool at night, bathing in the serene cerulean light, and shared a deep conversation in which Chloe talked about how much Max had changed. With these two conflicting visions of right and wrong, justice and injustice, battling in her head, Max says, Chloe, I can't make this choice. But Chloe oh, says, You're the only one who can. And then you have to choose, Chloe or the town. The statistical breakdown they let you view after each chapter is remarkably telling here. For most choices where there's two options, the split is typically between 75 and 25 and 60 to 40. But for this, the most important decision of the game, it's nearly even, about 50-50. For this alone, the developers deserve credit. Here it is, a contested, vital choice that is presented as the most important the player makes, and is actually a difficult choice for the Life is Strange community as a whole. This isn't an, of course this is the right decision for most people, and neither decision leaves you feeling clean even as the rain crashes down. Each decision appeals to a different type of people. Sacrificing Chloe to save the town is the logical, practical decision. She's one person. We care about her deeply, but her life is not as important as the lives of all the people in Arcadia Bay. If the people of Arcadia Bay were vile creatures, it would be acceptable, but they're not. You have Warren, the dorky kid who has a not-so-subtle crush on you. Then there is Victoria and her friends, who despite their bullying of Max and Kate are hurt, sympathetic characters with more going on than his first apparent. And if you saved Kate, 
she's another factor to consider. You stopped this girl from committing suicide. You're not just going to let her die now, are you? And what about Joyce, Chloe's overworked, sweethearted mother, who despite her flaws and blind spots, genuinely loves her daughter? And how about David Madsen, Chloe's stepfather, who despite his paranoia brought on by PTSD, resolves to be better toward her and Joyce, and saves Max from Jefferson? <laughs> Oh, Lord, Max. Are you okay? Are you alright? Can you move? Yes. Thank you, David. Thank you. Don't thank me. You brought me here. Let's wrap up this son of a bitch first. <laughs> He won't be going anywhere when he wakes up. Except you are going to prison forever. Or worse. These characters deserve to live. You can't with a clear conscience wipe them out, no matter how much Chloe means to you. And where's the guarantee that the town is all that will be wrecked? The strange conditions in Arcadia Bay, snow falling in warm weather, whales washing up on the beach, two moons appearing in the sky, started after Max began time traveling to save Chloe. If Chloe isn't sacrificed, who knows what tragedies could be unleashed on the world. The universe has made up its mind to kill Chloe, and sometimes you can't fight fate. Objectively and dispassionately, letting Chloe die is the better decision, and your conscience is spared agony by Chloe herself encouraging you to make that decision. You're not trading me! Maybe you've just been delaying my real destiny. Look at how many times I've almost died or actually died around you. Look at what's happened in Arcadia Bay ever since you first saved me. I know I've been selfish, but for once, I think I should accept my fate. Our fate, Chloe. Max, you finally came back to me this week, and you did nothing but show me your love and friendship. You made me smile and laugh like I haven't done in years. Wherever I end up after this, in whatever reality, all those moments between us were real, and they'll always be ours. She is willing to give herself up, but are you? Facts and figures are nice, but they're not the whole picture. Don't trust anyone who says they are. Read a random Wikipedia article and you'll see what I mean. Take the article on Paris. It talks about the history of the city and its climate and how expensive it is to live there, and that's all well and good and interesting, but it doesn't say anything about the heart and soul of the city. It doesn't get into any deep truths. The same could be said for the article on Homo sapiens, which reads like it was written by a robot. We can pretend that facts are all that is true, but our passions and fears hopes and dreams, those are true as well. I know I'm in the minority, but for me, choosing to save Chloe rather than Arcadia Bay was an easy decision. As a writer, I've always valued the subjective more than the objective. Opinions, beliefs, ideals, these are much more important than facts, if you ask me. You need facts, of course. They're the skeleton of society. Without it, society collapses and cannot function effectively. But a skeleton by itself is no more than a dead body. Opinions, beliefs, ideals. These are what make the world more than a collection of atoms and molecules. But enough philosophy for now. It was an easy choice to choose Chloe because she mattered to me. I had a personal connection with her, and I was not about to let the wonderful week we had spent together be wasted. Not anymore. Max, I'll always be with you. Forever.
Often, when a character wants to choose a loved one over the world, I shout at them at the top of my lungs and call them selfish and other much worse names. It doesn't help that in these scenarios, we are given little reason to care about the relationship between the two. This happens most often with a male hero and their damsel in distress girlfriend. The work acts like this is a moral quandary, and I'm screaming at the hero to save the world because there's no chemistry between the two. I don't care about them, and usually the hero is ignoring an easily seen option that will let them save both their love and the world. It's contrived drama anyway, as the villain typically messes up and the hero doesn't have to make a, the difficult choice in the end. But in Life is Strange, there is no easy way out. There are villains in this game, but they have been dealt with by the finale. You're being forced to make this choice by no less than the forces of time and space themselves. And I do care about the relationship between Chloe and Max. Warren, Kate, David, Madsen, Joyce, the other townspeople of Arcadia Bay. I love them all, but I'd sacrifice them in a heartbeat so that Max can have Chloe by her side. Warren's adorable, but Max does not need him. She needs Chloe. Since we were tweens, and it's like no time has passed. I wish Rachel was here to meet you. Why? I bet she would hate me. You're not that different. She had, has a great eye for images and for art. Plus, she's a smartass like you. We would all be hella best friends forever. I know she must be as cool as you are. I have no doubt we'll meet soon. Railroad tracks always make me feel better. I have no idea why. Kerouac knew. It's the romance of travel and movement. The sound of the train whistle at night. Look at the beat poet here. I'd rather be a good photographer. You are. You just have to stop being afraid. You can say that Max will be alright because she still has memories of her week with Chloe, so it doesn't matter if that week is erased from existence. But that's a banal interpretation. Memories fade, and if the bay is saved, there's no record of those memories. It's like they never happened. This will make them fade faster. The day may be saved, if you choose the bay, but Max isn't. If you choose to let Chloe die, you're treated to Nathan's last line before he shoots her. Nobody would ever even miss your punk ass, would they? It hurts. Chloe of the present may be bold and selfless and willing to sacrifice herself for the common good, but the Chloe of the past never got to experience that character growth. The Chloe of the past never got to know there were still people who cared about her. As far as she knows, Nathan Prescott's words are correct. She dies believing herself to be unlucky and unloved. She never gets to be Max's partner in crime, and her partner in time. She never gets to be the Dean Moriarty to Max's Sal Paradise. Throughout the course of a week, Max grows from the shy girl who loves photography to a mature, decisive young woman. But Chloe undergoes an even more radical transformation. Since Max left, Chloe's life got worse, to say the least. Her father died in a car accident, and her mother replaced him with David Madsen, the security guard. Chloe dyed her hair, was kicked out of Blackwell, and fell in love with a mysterious girl named Rachel Amber. To Chloe, Rachel was an angel, not just a lover, but salvation incarnate. Rachel saved Chloe, but then Rachel disappeared and Chloe looked for her, a mission that would lead only to more pain. Without Max saving her life, Chloe would never have gotten a chance to develop into the person that asked her not to. I know I've been selfish, but for once, I think I should accept my fate. Our fate. But it's not just about Max and Chloe. It's primarily about them, but it is also about fate. From a practical, objective viewpoint, one could look at the circumstances and say that you can't fight fate in this universe. Chloe is going to die, and there is nothing you can do about it. You've saved her again and again, but death keeps following her, never breaking its pursuit. 
It reminds me of Steins Gate, another character-focused time travel work that I absolutely adore. After Mayuri's shocking death in the middle of the series, Okabe does everything in his power to save her, but it is to no avail. She always dies, like it's her destiny, but that does not stop him from doing everything in his power to try to keep her alive. As a side note, and I'm being sincere when I say that this is something I did not know until I sat down to do research for this episode, Mayuri in the dub of Steins Gate is voiced by Ashley Birch, Chloe's voice actress in Life is Strange. Fitting, don't you think? All right, you may say. It may be right for Max to save Chloe time and time again, but should I, the player, viewing the situation from a distance, act with the same fervor? If you care about Chloe nearly as much as I do, the answer is an obvious yes. But even if you don't, the alternative is to accept the fate given to you. It's thrilling, isn't it? Running from the clutches of what seems inevitable. Not because you necessarily think you can win, but because it's the right thing to do, and to act otherwise would be bowing to a cruel authority. This is a common theme in many of my favorite Japanese games, such as Xenoblade Chronicles and Final Fantasy X. In FF10, the powers that be see fit for a giant whale of judgment to roam the world, destroying cities and forcing the citizens of Spira to live in fear. This is the way it's always been, and everyone has accepted that's the way it will always be. Everyone except Titus, Aaron, and eventually Yuna and the rest of your company. The same dynamic is at play in Life is Strange. So what if the universe is out to kill Chloe? Too bad for the universe, I'm not giving in. I will not let the waters of fate carry her away. No matter what happens, I will fight for Chloe. That's my reasoning. Those who chose to sacrifice Chloe without a second thought will laugh. But in this apathetic world, you have to stand for something. And standing against the forces of fate and for someone you care about is a noble cause. I've spent more time dissecting the merits of the Save Chloe option than the Save Arcadia Bay option, because it was my choice, one, and because sacrificing Chloe, the more logical, objective option, requires less justification than the subjective, emotionally-based alternative, which is keeping her alive, but both are fantastic endings that wrap up the story in a bittersweet but satisfying manner. They may not be the endings players wanted, but they are the right endings. Though differing on a fundamental level, they both cap off the story of Max and Chloe. Arcadia Bay and time travel neither feels cheap or underbaked. Depending on the player's perspective, Chloe's character development could either be a reason to choose to sacrifice her because she has come to a revelation and redeemed herself, or a reason to keep her alive because she'd die lonely and believing no one cared about her. As a writer, let me say how difficult a writing challenge this is. It is hard enough to make sure that scenes contribute thematically to the conclusion of a story. To not just do that well, but do it for two separate conclusions is no less than miraculous. Bravo. Truly. Think about the beginning of the game. What is the main mystery? Why do I, Maxine Caulfield, have time traveling powers? There's also a secondary mystery. What happened to Rachel Amber? The first mystery is never solved, which I actually like. It reminds me of Hitchcock's The Birds. Unlike, say, when the likes of Korra explained what the Avatar is, talking about the origin of Max's powers wouldn't be interesting or thematically purposeful. It would just feel contrived, like in Spectre, when it was revealed that the villains of the last several Bond movies were connected in this way too intricate and nonsensical fashion. You find out what happened to Rachel Amber, but it's exactly what you feared. Who the killer was turned out to be a surprise, and Jefferson makes a downright Lynchian villain. 
But stopping him is not the climax of the game, which comes much later. Nothing you do in the climax can save Rachel Amber, and Jefferson's already been defeated. Now, the climax comes down to a very simple choice. Your friend, and possible love interest, or the town. It brings the focus of the game back where it belongs, on Max and Chloe's relationship. And anyway, in a game about choice, it is only fitting that the climax be a choice made by you, the player, with the entire weight of your experience throughout the game weighing on you. You have to make what is not only the most important decision, but also the most telling. There are two ways a story like this can end. You can fight fate and save the ones you love. This is what I like to call the Steins Gate or the Last of Us ending. Or you can give in and sacrifice for the greater good, which is what I'd like to call the Donnie Darko ending. How one responds in a situation like this, in a game or in life, says much about them. Do they value the objective or the subjective more? The big picture or the personal element? If you don't know which you are, play the game. You will find out. Trust me. Playing Life is Strange, you not only discover the intricacies in your characters, but also the intricacies in yourself. In the end, after five episodes of lying, betrayal, bonding, dancing, timeline hopping, swimming, and fighting fate, the power is in your hands. You may not want to decide, but Chloe's right. You're the only one who can. Life is Strange is one of those rare games that makes me infinitely proud to be a gamer. For the record, the slang is not over the top. It's quite natural, actually, and it adds to the flavor. Those who criticize it probably say a handful of phrases that are as strange to an outsider as the slang in this game, or maybe even stranger. As much as I love Life is Strange, though, I'd probably be best to refrain from making videos this long in the future. They drain me and wring me out, especially when they're combined with all my other responsibilities. By the time this video is published, school will have started again, and I won't have time for 20 minute plus videos. I'll be too busy with homework and college applications, and of course my own novel writing escapades. Nonetheless, I'm proud to present you with this, my longest video to this point. If you liked what you saw today, consider donating to my Patreon so I can produce even more amazing content. Also, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe all that totally righteous stuff. Adios, comrades!